Hello, hello and welcome. Good evening and welcome to this very important discussion. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we can't see you, but we know you're out there, but uh, you know, you can see us and really delighted to have you here tonight. And it's worth knowing that even as we meet, even as we're talking tonight, TV made in Yorkshire is currently being broadcast. But then we have to think, well, then what? Where does it go? And should we actually care? Well, I think, and I hope, that our panel tonight will argue very strongly that we do care and that we should care. So with no further ado, let me introduce you to our panel. So, first of all, Sue Howard. Now, Sue has taken the Yorkshire Film Archive from a small collection of amateur films through to a highly successful regional film archive with purpose-built premises and a small team skilled to care for and create access to the collections for both public audiences and commercial clients. And in 2013, Sue led the merger with the North East Film Archive and is now responsible for operations across both regions with bases in York at York St John University and in Middlesbrough, where the archive vaults and offices are based at Teesside University. We're also joined today by Sally Joynson and Sally is Chief Executive of Screen Yorkshire, which champions and supports growth in the screen industries across Yorkshire and the Humber. She's been a long-standing advocate for the screen heritage sector and in the past has worked with regional film archives across England. She is a trustee of the Yorkshire and North East Film Archive. She's an advisory board member of the National Science and Media Museum and chairs the Digital Creativity Labs at the University of York. And Sue Todd has joined us today and Sue is the UK Partnership Manager at BFI and she leads on stakeholder relationships with the 13 national and regional film archives across the UK. She's worked on the three major screen heritage projects with BFI and the regional and national archives. Heritage 2022 digitised 100,000 at-risk videotapes, Unlocking Film Heritage digitising 10,000 films and Screen Heritage UK working with Screen Yorkshire. Sue has also worked at Arts Council Northwest and Yorkshire Arts. She was a freelance arts and media consultant for over 14 years and in her early days worked as a curator at the Media Museum in Bradford. We're also joined by Mark Whitty, who uh, I think you've got a programme going out at the moment, Mark, because you're a producer from ITV Calendar. Very, and a very, I know this is a, a matter very important to your heart. And we're also joined by David Wormstone, who is the archive manager for BBC News based at Salford Media City, managing and supporting network and regional news library teams across England. David has worked in numerous roles over his career, including archive roles in BBC Leeds and ITV Yorkshire, and is currently working on regional digitization projects ahead of the BBC centenary in 2022. So that's our panel today. Uh, we've got a range of questions we're going to look at, but if you have any questions you want to ask or issues you want to raise, please feel free to use the Q&A function, which is, should be somewhere at the bottom of your screen, and we will try and get to those as we go through the evening. But if we end up having too big a conversation among the panel, which I'm sure we will do, please don't be offended if we don't get to all the questions. So with no further ado, I'm going to get us going, and I'm going to come straight to you first of all, Sally. Um, why do you think, why is this discussion important? Uh, well, I think the first thing I would say, Fiona, is just to pick up on your original question, which was about, does it matter? Does it, is, is it worth preserving? We've got this material going out. Um, should we be looking after it? So my starting point is to say, absolutely, it's vitally important. It does matter and we should be pre preserving it. Um, but the biggest challenge that we've got in that is that the landscape for TV content, for content as a whole, has changed and is continuing to change absolutely dramatically. We're no longer in a time where we have a handful of broadcasters um, uh, producing content, very easily manageable, easy to know who you're negotiating with, uh, you know what kind of rights you're looking for. Now we have an explosion of content makers. We have an explosion of platforms, an explosion of producers. How on earth do you chart a course through that new landscape? And I think that is the biggest challenge facing the screen heritage sector at the moment. What do you, what do you conserve? What do you preserve? Who do you negotiate with? Who is your audience for it? I mean, and, and also it's the other thing that 
content made in Yorkshire is not just for Yorkshire anymore. It is now, it is produced for audiences across the globe. So the whole basis on which we used to determine what to collect, what to preserve has changed enormously. And, and I think that's why this discussion now is so important. And it's not just about the producers of content, it's also about the audiences for that content and how we connect with them. So um, even before coronavirus came along and, and accelerated a change in business models, you have got a, a sector that is changing dramatically and screen heritage and the principles and policies behind that have to change with it um, and recognize this enormous change in the landscape. So I think that's probably the, the main point that I would want to make, that the world has changed and we've got some really tough questions to, to, to answer on this. Thank you. I suppose the, the big question there is that the world has changed so much in terms of the broadcast landscape. Uh, so should this be led nationally and regionally at a policy level? So that brings me on to Sue, Sue and Sue to ask, you know, how does regional and national policy work with regards to archiving? Okay, should I go first, Sue? Yep. Okay, so it's a bit of a double act. Well, uh, firstly, I don't have all the answers because those are huge questions. If we look at the sort of title of this session, it's about Yorkshire's TV heritage. So as an archivist, I look at that as, are we talking about those legacy collections? Which is the collections that, that we care for here at the Yorkshire Film Archive? So we've always got one foot looking backwards. How do we preserve it? How do we care for it? How do we continue to create access to it? Looking forward, wow, those questions are so different. So that's going to be such a big challenge for the future. I think that's probably a whole different debate, but one that we have to have. So maybe this is just series one of these discussions. In terms of the legacy collections, my question sort of builds on the size, which is, you know, we're all going to say, of course it's valuable. The question to me is, who is it valuable to and why? So what's the value? Is it valuable because it's a you know, key cultural asset of the 20th century? Yes. Is it valuable to the rights holders? Yeah, is, has it got commercial value still? Is there more money to be squeezed out of it? Probably. Or in terms of regional collections, is it of most value to regional communities who identify with it, who have a, have a sort of ownership of it, and who want to see it and see it and see more of it? which is what we find every time we show it. For sure, I would argue it's all three of those things. What I would also argue is, if we don't continue to keep it visible, that value will diminish. So how do we incentivize investment into these collections so that actually we can extract that value? So that in itself is a big question. Thank you. Yeah. What do we do about policy? Well, uh, we try to work in collaboration. I would sort of veer away from the word policy towards strategy, which is where Sue Todd comes in because she does love a bit of process. <laughs> Um, Sally, you know, what you said at the beginning is absolutely critical in terms of the changing landscape and the challenges. Um, and just to give an indication of, if you know, you're asking how does it work nationally, regionally, I think the, the, the three major programmes and strategies that we've worked on over the last 10, 12 years are the key example of how, it, how we work nationally in partnership. And I think that partnership is absolutely essential going forwards, particularly as things change so rapidly. Um, and we've been able to work through the major programmes over the last year, first to identify and make sure collections are safe and increasingly to work, create access through mass digitisation. 
and the focus at the moment is mass digitization of videotape before um, it's going to be impossible to digitize that material and I think increasingly we've built that partnership with um, regional archives like Yorkshire Film Archive and work in that network across the UK. Um, the focus is very much on, on kind of programme delivery, um, um, working with the, the regional archives and, you know, we're working towards the, you know, the next stage of a strategy. But I, in a way, the, the strategies can be summed up in terms of collecting, preserving and making, making that material accessible. Um, yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. The thing about a strategy is that it means that people have to buy into it for it to actually work. And one of the things we want to talk about a bit later in this hour is, is how we can actually get people on board. Because it means people have to want to do this. That's the only way a strategy will actually work. So moving on to, to, to just for an example, really, looking at something like news, which both Mark and, and David are involved in. And to those who are watching, David's got a bit of a problem with the internet. So he comes in and out. It's very exciting that he, he, it is a bit in and out. So we'll try and get as much as we can out of you now, David, before you're in. Yeah, yeah. But news can often be felt as being very ephemeral. It happens and it goes. Yet at the same time, we know a lot of programmes are hugely reliant on going back to news broadcast whenever. Yeah. So bring it back in. So to, tell me about looking at ITV Calendar and BBC Look North. What's the value of your own archives? you know in terms of those long-standing regional news brands i don't know which of you wants to go first mark or david uh, i'll go first um uh, i guess it's there's quite a lot of different things where it comes to a news archive uh, at its basic level it's it's also a news library so we use we reuse a lot of the content uh, so there's a lot of value in it just from a production base that we'd like to we like to run with stories we like to keep going with archive uh, it's also got its historical and social values as well because things change and even though it was may, maybe was seen as ephemeral at the time, 10 years later everything's changed, we moved on. Uh, so looking at history uh, backwards and seeing the moving images of industry and changes in landscape, uh, I, I think they, they excite people, they bring back memories, they bring back nostalgia, but they also kind of show how things have moved on. Um, so I think that people get a lot of experience out of them and in, in a sense they've got probably more reuse value than other programming areas because it literally is the things that happen down the end of your street and that they're a lot closer to people. Um, so, so from a BBC point of view, I mean, and, and ITV for that matter, we've got archive going back to 68 uh, from Yorkshire when they were trying to pull away from London and give a, a regional accent to what was going on in the world. Um, and, and that's where the value of the regional broadcast really kind of kick started from a crowd across the region. They were trying to kind of decentralize the news and make uh, local stories more available uh, and, and not looking at it from a, from a national point of view. Um, and we, as we Sue and Sue would be mentioning, there's, there's all the issues with formats, there's all the issues with access, but we do see that there's value in it. And that's why we're trying various different routes to get more content digitized, more access available, plus the day-to-day -day things that actually these the still make news broadcasts. And there are ongoing stories that still rely on images from the past. Yeah. Mark? And also there's something about regional news as well that, that captures that, that kind of social history so strongly yeah. as well, isn't it? That it, it, it it's, a, it's a look back, not just to the news, but to the social mores of the time. So, Mark, from a point of view of the, the, the calendar brand, and you'll need to unmute, you have unmuted yourself. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, trying to put a, a monetary value on, on, on what we've got is difficult, but to us, it's absolutely invaluable because it's, we, we have footage going as per, as with, with Look North, going back more than 50 years. And in, in the Leeds Library, we obviously have stuff going back even further than that because we have all of uh, Granada's programs and now obviously the entire ITV uh, library virtually so in our, in our I did a program with um, Robert Palmer and Joe Cocker when we used to do um, regional half hours and they were based on Granada footage of people like Little Richard and um, Robert Palmer did a, a jazz program so it was Duke Ellington and Count Basie and these are absolutely amazing stuff which hadn't been seen uh, in about 50 years um, 
as for news, you know, when you're doing stories like the, the Yorkshire Ripper, um, invaluable, um, the, I don't know if anyone saw the Pembrokeshire murders drama recently, but the um, episode of Bullseye, which they were looking for, was right there in our Leeds um, library. So obviously Leeds Library solved the murder um, in some ways. Um, but being able to access that kind of thing is absolutely amazing. And, and the old adage from Yorks TV was that we were a window on the world. Uh, I think that was what Alan Wicker said when he was traversing uh, across the globe. And it, it still is. Um, a lot of stuff is being digitized from telecine uh, from, the, from the early days. And to be able to get access to that, um, it's, it's a bit hit and miss. So you'll, you'll, you'll ring Ben in the library and say, have you got this? And he'll say, it's on telecine, you can't have it. Or it's been digitized and you can. Um, and it's, it's, to us, it's absolutely invaluable. I can't think of a week going by without calling the library to say, can I have this from 1992? Or can I have this from, you pick a year, you know, and it's, it's fantastic to get it out. And it's usually on tape um, and we still have the uh, facility to transfer tape. Uh, which is good. Um, so to me and to all my fellow producers in news, an absolutely invaluable source. And I think you've all touched on the notion of technology as well and formats and how they change and the formats that we're using today in, in a matter of just a few years, they're going to be obsolete as it were. So it's about how we capture it. And I think if we think about the current situation we're going through with the pandemic, 50 years time, 100 years time, 200 years time, people are going to be wanting to look back at this as a resource. So hence the importance of finding a way of being able to pull all this together. But I mean, um, is, there, is there a relationship? I mean, Dave, David and Sue, what's the relationship between the Yorkshire Film Archive and regional newsrooms around this archiving and future digital news content? Shall I go, David? Yeah, fine, yep. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I'll start off by saying it's good, you know, with both ITV and BBC. We hold uh, significant collections of both. We are constantly phoned by both newsrooms saying, can you just tell us any this? Can you just do that for us? So there's an ongoing sort of supply chain, but we're safeguarding the original collections. But actually, I think it's it's a lot more than that. It's about building the relationships because you know, it's it, it's fine responding to connections or responding to, to requests. But what we do need to do is get that overall strategy for how do we look at the whole thing? Because that's when you begin to see just how much rich content there is. And everybody said, yeah, it is about social history. It is about those connections. To me, it's also about representation on screen. So when you get local people interviewed, you, you, you get those local dialects, you get people saying, oh, that's so-and-so. Do you remember when they did that? It's, you know, it's sort of real lifeblood of people in every region, you know, and absolutely here in Yorkshire and the Northeast. So, so there's a sort of layer of relationships between us and the production companies, the television companies that we work with, and that we work with both to protect and preserve, but also to create access. Thank you. David, would you like to add to that, or Mark? I think David's frozen again. Uh, yes, I'm, we're, we're forever on to the Yorkshire Film Archive. <laughs> it's, first of all, check whether you've got it yourself and then find out yeah. you've not. Um, the stuff they, we, we've done features on the Yorkshire Film Archive and some of the, the, the stuff from, from um, uh, the Queen anniversaries and commemorations and 25th mm -hmm. anniversaries on the front and street parties from 1977 that we may not have got to or, or way, way further back than that. Um, these are wonderful, wonderful pictures and people love seeing them. And often, I mean, I, I did a, a piece a while ago from some um, archive filmed in 1968 in a, in a slum street in Leeds and there's some kind of urchin kids in the corner mm -hmm. playing around. We put it out and said, is this you? And three of them got back to us and said, yes, that's me. Um, so we brought them back in, into the studio, put them in an edit suite and 
filmed them looking at themselves from 50 years ago. And um, it was great. It, it took some finding, but um, just to be able for them to look, look back on their life as it was, um, there's, there's, you know, you, you, we could do it every day. There's an archive piece to be done, but obviously there's floods and COVID and all sorts of things getting in the way. Yeah, and I think that, that's the problem. That's something we need to talk about, really, is, is the priority of this for, for people who are actually making, making the stuff. But we'll come on to that in a moment. David, you've moved, you've changed. You've changed uh, the ground. I'm, I'm going closer to my router. I'll see if that helps. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you heard any of that or if there's anything you want to add to it. Um, I, I missed that bit, but um, uh, yeah, I, I'll have to move on from that. It's the importance of, of these, uh, the, this digital news content uh, uh, for both the BBC and for ITV regionally. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, there's a the massive benefit to having things digitally available now. Uh, after, after years, I mean, as we mentioned previously, with the issues we've got with all the assets, the fact that uh, formats keep changing. So there's always that little bit of collection that you can't touch because we've lost the machines or we've lost the ability to use them. Uh, so actually getting everything in, in, in a place where people can access it from anywhere, take it onto their phones, take it onto their laptops, it, it's massively changed how, how we access content and how much we can reuse content. Um, even going back to quite uh, only a few years ago when things were massively different. Yeah, I was talking to uh, James McMillan the other day, and that's a plug for a new RTS Yorkshire Talks that's coming out soon, <clears throat> because ITV Content Delivery do a lot of film restoration for BritBox, and they won an award at our last RTS Yorkshire Awards for the uh, restoration they did on Carry On at the Khyber. Right. But he was talking about how they have to retain all this technology They've got this kind of museum room full of all the technology so that they can, anything that comes along, they can find a way of, of, of restoring it. And, it. and it's things like that we, we, we really have to think about, isn't it? Now, yeah. this is a question coming through on the Q&A, so I'm going to actually ask it. Uh, and it says, uh, I think it might be from our good friend, Mike Best. And it says, these days, any archive from the past is gold dust for program makers, which you've just all demonstrated. But if anything major happens today, there will literally be millions of posts online within minutes. How does the archivist decide what to keep from all that? And how worried are you about the impact of fake news? Good question. Right, good, yeah. good question. Who wants to go with that one? I know Sue, Sue Howard, it's, it's a conversation <laughs> now, isn't it, about all the all the digital stuff that where people self shoot and that gets used in various places and how do we pull in all of that because it's no longer a case of somebody having old super eight in their garage that they find it's now all on 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 these things yeah and big thank you to mike best for posing such a simple question so so thank you mike um you're right. It's, if we look at those legacy collections, I mean, they are they are huge, but they are finite. So it was way more manageable. How we actually deal with, you know, all the technologies and all the, the platforms, etc., and the way people communicate today is something completely different. So yeah, the question is, it, it's a good question. But it's also a question about responsibility, because who should be doing it? And should is there is there anyone that could? Because there is so much content that you couldn't possibly attempt to do that. So what are how are we going to approach that? Uh, that yeah, you know, that that's such a big question to ask. Yeah, I mean, the, the other issue with it is just the volumes of content as well, because it, even making a selection out of it, because uh, there, there is literally so much coming at you from so many different mediums now. Um, so I mean, we are, we, we obviously, we have our policy on, on what we have to keep as a transmission point of view. We have then selection and retention on the back of that, some things that we think might be useful in the future. And we're also constantly trying to work with new technology and see how we deal with mm -hmm. Twitter and Facebook and all those, uh, and, and constantly updating our policies to try and meet demands, but they're ever changing. Can I just add to that, it's in one sense, it's one of the advantages or it's a really good example of collaboration 
because that is something that no single regional archive can address on its own. Um, because you know, the, you know, it it covers collecting policy, it covers contemporary collecting, it covers digital capability. Um, and I, you know, those are the things that if when we come together in the partnership with BFI and all the regional and national archives, those are the things we all need to tackle um, and look at how we work on that together. It, it's a whopping great issue that nobody's got an answer to. In fact, I just like to add to that because um, it comes back to what I began the session by saying that the, the landscape has changed so much. There are so many, more, you know, if I'm standing there with a, with a phone filming something, I am a producer of content. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. You, given the amount of content that's being produced, not just in Yorkshire, but globally, you will never be able to manage that volume of, of content. The only thing I'd say is that really good content does tend to find its way through. It gets noticed um, and somehow it finds its way to the top. Um, uh, but but it, that's a very ad hoc process and it's a very difficult process to manage. When it comes to fake news, I think what's going to be interesting in that is that it will emerge as a genre of its own. It will be an area that people actually actively look to collect and collate um, content because it's, it is such a, a, a relatively new phenomenon and we have seen how effectively um, it, it can be used. So I think fake news will, will emerge, but as a genre of, of its own. Thank you. David, Mark, do you want to add to that or do you think they've covered it well in saying what a massive, great big task it is, but an important one. But Sally's point about stuff will rise up and, and it will be, it will come through in some other format. Yeah, I, I think tremendously valid points. So every day people are, are, are becoming citizen journalists. Um, in terms of what we keep, it's, it's what we broadcast is what we keep. Um, and then, of course, there's the web and anything else that's put out on Twitter is a record. Um, but you do have to try to uh, look at things from both sides, from our point of view. Obviously, we're not, we're not biased towards one or the other, like some newspapers are able to be or some of the news organisations lean to one way or another. Here in Yorkshire, you try to be as balanced as, as possible. So uh, hopefully what we keep is a balanced record. Um, but there could be... Uh, Fake news on its own is an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I suppose following from that, there's always the element of managing resource as well, and just how much resource you've got to dedicate to all this, because uh, the technologies keep changing, but the staffing levels don't necessarily. So it, it's what we can deal with. Yeah, and that, that I think is a big issue that will have to come through any strategy. If, if somebody actually nationally took on responsibility and had funding for us. A, a nationwide strategic approach to this and I mean obviously the BFI does a considerable amount there but your resources are limited so in terms of, of managing this so it's who are the keepers yeah and there's never enough resource and in some sense yes the landscape is changing platforms are exploding but hasn't an issue to some extent always been there's more produced than can be preserved curation collecting policies and resource are critical um, within that. Yeah, and it's who makes those decisions, isn't it? Who are the people who are actually gatekeeping all of this? Like, you know, we, we lost all those Doctor Who episodes because people didn't see it as being an important issue going forward because it was all brand new. Well, now we've learned from that and we've probably got all this stuff and some of it probably never see the light of day again, but we know it's but we know it's there, but it's who makes those decisions. We've actually got another question coming through, which I think is a good follow on from that, that, that one about who accesses it. And this is from Peter Gordon. Hello, Peter. Um, it says, can you say something about copyright? Is there archive you cannot use because of a lack of paperwork? Sue, do you want to do that? <laughs> well, I do it. Okay. Well, actually, I, I was going to just introduce that to the last question as well, because if you're talking, Fiona, about you know, some sort of overarching policy, then you, know, you have to think, who are the rights holders? So we're here as an archive, but we don't own those collections. We don't own the rights to those collections. The producers of those programmes own the rights. 
So you you can't you can't simply look at it in you know through just one lens. So so rights are really important. There will always be content that is really quite locked down because of rights issues. So yet again, you've got that complicated process that it isn't just about the content, it isn't just about the technology, it's also about the rights. So, and then it's about the resource. So yeah, there's all of these layers that go into that, protecting, preserving, creating access to it, collecting, how we do it in the future, there's layers to all of it. So it's a it's a complex picture, but but it's a fascinating one, which is why we're all here and why we're all doing our jobs. Absolutely. And people often forget that, that television actually requires administration, it requires a lot of paperwork. And I'm thinking back to what Sally said at the beginning about when we just had the major broadcasters who were producing content, it was relatively straightforward. But then as independent companies came through mm -hmm. and, and produced work and then they got merged or they disappeared or whatever. What happens to all that? It's not just about whether the rights are there, but who actually owns those rights when the company that originally produced it no yeah. longer exists. So it becomes almost like a detective story. And we know that takes yes. a long time and resource. Yeah, Sally, I think you were commenting earlier about uh, independence and um, rights. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, this touches on a really, really interesting um, uh, issue because so, you know, we used to have just broadcasters producing content. Now we have an independent sector producing content and that independent is, as the name suggests, independent and it ranges from these huge multinational companies like Fremantle through to the very very small production company and if you look at Yorkshire and you look at the bulk of the Indies in Yorkshire they are predominantly small companies producing factual content some of those are owned either in full or part by um, a bigger brand for example True North and Sky so you've got an awful lot of players in there and I, I think that there is a challenge. In, in an ideal world, you would like to think that the makers of content would also have some kind of responsibility for the, the preservation and protection of that content. But unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. And the reality of the independent sector is that actually sometimes when you get a commission, that involves handing the rights to that program over for if not in perpetuity, for a very, very length, very long period of time. So producers, it's not the case that producers still own the rights to their programme. They are now tied up in multiple different sorts of deals with different organisations um, and sold, not just, you've not just got the, the domestic market, but you've got the international market. So Fiona, you're absolutely right in describing it as, I mean, it's, it's detective work to work out who actually owns the rights. And again, just as you said, the independent sector is fluctuates enormously. You get companies being bought out by another company, but when the market gets really tough, you will see the disappearance of a number of small indies. So what happens to that content? If you go back, you know, to two decades, and you look at the number of independents that were operating in Yorkshire, there were about 40 of them. Some of them were brass nameplate companies, but you had companies like The View from the North producing all the Fred, Dib Fred Dibner material. I mean, a long, long track record, but those companies, if they don't, if they still exist, they don't exist in the, in the way that they used to do. So ownership of material, is, is a really complex thing. And it is, as I say, in an ideal world, it would be great to say the producers have responsibility, the makers hold the, the, the role for, produce, um, for preserving. But actually a lot of that now rests with broadcasters and those broadcasters now include small digital channels. So you also have to look at where is, is not just the responsibility, but where is the incentive? in a highly commercial center, sector, where is the incentive and the responsibility for digital broadcasters who are commissioning a lot of this new content 
to actually preserve and protect that material. So it's, you know, these are all really, really difficult issues to, to deal with. But if you are an indie and you are producing, you know, high volume, low budget stuff, and you have sold the rights with that material to the commissioner, then whose responsibility is it at that point? That's a very good question. So let, let me put it out to all of you. Should the responsibility then for making sure that we retain all this rich heritage fall onto the broadcasters? That's where we should be going. I, I think that's fine. If you're a PSB, then you can argue that you have a responsibility in that, in that role. If you are not a PSB and you are commercially focused digital channel, then why would they want to get involved in this? And I'm sure everybody recognizes the value of this material, but from a commercial point of view, is that the role of, of the sect, of that part of the TV sector, the content sector? So is it that we need to make it more commercially uh, attractive then? So that it becomes part of the asset as it were. So it's seen as an asset that can be then use the word sweated. Yeah. Or in some sense, it's, uh, is it part, I mean, that's what's interesting about this panel and, you know, future discussions. Is it about building the relationships and the dialogue um, between the archives and the production sector, particularly the smaller? Um, I mean, obviously with, you know, the, the broadcasters as well, but with the smaller um, production companies, um, bec yeah, because, the, the public archives don't have the resource or the capacity to preserve all of the material. But if there isn't a dialogue and building those relationships, material will get lost. Um, I, I think it's a very good point. I mean, the, the independent sector will have obligations to do, hold the material that they have produced for a, for a certain period of time. That will be included in the, the contract with um, whichever broadcaster they're working to. So there is something in there, but again, it comes, you know, it comes down to resource, doesn't it? I, I, I couldn't count how many indie independents there are in the, in the sector at the moment. Um, I'd probably be here all night if I tried to um, count them all, but it is a huge job. But given the way the content is being produced and consumed now, then it is something that I think we have to look at really seriously. But for me, I, I think there is a responsibility on broadcasters and where you see digital channels being um, bought up by, for example, the BBC or one of the big global brands, then it's almost like that is your point of negotiation. That's the point of contact. That's who you negotiate with to make them understand, to, to have that discussion about the value of the material that they are now own, owning. Thank you. I, I'm going to move us on to a question from Claire, uh, who's at the Media Archive for Central England. Uh, because she's put a question up here that I think relates to what we're talking about. She says, what are your thoughts about the future relationship between the broadcasters and the regional film archive in terms of collecting regionally produced born digital material? And she goes on to say, will the responsibility rest mainly with the broadcasters who make selections about what they will maintain, while the regional film archives will keep the older analogue material but not take new accessions of born digital material? Hey, Sue, shall I come to you for that one? You can do. I think, sadly, the university have decided to start industrially cleaning the footpaths outside my office. So I apologise. That's why I was on mute, thinking, no, surely not now. But, so apologies for the background noise and the flashing lights. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it, it would be much simpler if, if, if we were working with those legacy collections, because if we have to take on that new role, it becomes something else entirely. And Claire's right, then it comes down to a question of resource. So again, it's resource and it's responsibility. And if we were doing that, what rights would then we have to do something with it? So what's our incentive? You, we, um, there, was, there were the same, really, they were the same debates in a way with the legacy collections in that 
you know, woo, you, these, these films are taking up loads of storage space. We need to be more agile. We need to smaller premises. Let's put them in an archive. So, so questions for us as archives are, yes, that's, that's great because this, this content has cultural value. It's about our regions. Yeah, of course we want to preserve it, but hang on a minute. You know, we're not just a free storage center. So what can we do with it? They're actually having really tight agreements about how we use those legacy collections that we've got now, but also how we might have different agreements for the future would be crucial to it. And, and sadly, it comes down to resource. And I think it also comes down to some extent to a joined up conversation. I feel like I, I, I kind of go on and on and on. The picture across all of the regional, uh, regional and national archives is different. Not all hold um, legacy collections from either ITV or BBC. It's, it's historically, it's a, it's a mixed picture. I think that kind of conversation or that question that Claire is asking, do the regional national archives hold the legacy material and broadcasters have responsibility for holding born digital? I think it actually needs to be a joined up conversation and a national um, conversation. Thank you. Anybody else want to contribute on that one? No? Okay, I'm going to move, move us on then to, to look at that. We're, what we're talking about is, is these conversations. So uh, going back to you, uh, uh, Sue Howard, with the Yorkshire Film Archive, uh, what kind of conversations have you been having, have you been able to have with the independent production sector in our region about uh, about archiving? Um, I mean, we do have conversations. They're mainly reactive conversations as opposed to proactive conversations, simply because, you know, we're, we're a small team. We're really busy. Television is just part of our collections. So, you know, the, the time is, is limited to do that. But we would welcome those conversations, but you know, it's not it's not something that we have active time, given the current situation that, that we're pursuing. Yeah, and um, as, as Sally said, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. How would you do it? Organizations, they don't. It's not top of their list of discussions to be had. But then at the same time, most production companies are relying on archive material. So it's how oh, okay. that it becomes important. It moves up a little bit. Sue Todd, do you want to come in on that? You look like you were going to say something, but you need to unmute yet. No, no, I, I, Sue was going to jump in. I mean, it's about the relationships for storing collections, but it's also access to material um, by um, production companies. Yeah. There's been a really big jump in that during lockdown. Um, you know, when production companies have been unable to shoot, um, we've seen, you know, across the board, quite a lot of um, inquiries coming in to use content from the archives. Yeah, so just a very quick example, Captain Sir Tom, born in Ilkley. You. Did we have somebody on the phone straight away about it? Ilkley content? Of course we did. So yeah, production companies in terms of the archive as a supplier of content, absolutely all the time. Sorry, Fiona, because I was thinking you were talking to me about, are you having live conversations with the independents that say, how are we gonna care for your collections in the future? Well, I was as well. Yeah. Okay. So okay. said on to that, Sally. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think that um, there's another part to this that actually uh, there are the regional independents and we can help convene a forum um, for the archive to talk to those regional independents. But the question is, what is the ask? What are you? We know that the, the independents can source archive material through YFA Northeast. But what is the offer to the independent sector? Um, and I think that's one of the things we'd need to work on. But the other thing is that that the content that is made about Yorkshire is not always made by Yorkshire companies. Yeah. 
So a prime example might be, you know, um, we've part financed the latest series of All Creatures Great and Small. That is not made by a Yorkshire company. It's a big Yorkshire brand. It's shot in Yorkshire, but it's made by Playground and their base is London. So what do you, when you're talking about negotiating with Indies, um, with the independent sector, you're not just doing it, you know, you, there are a series of other decisions that you need to make about what is the content that you're trying to get at, but it's not always people based in this region that will be the producers and the rights owners of that material. And I think the importance of these conversations is recognising that although this is about, uh, is about preserving uh, Yorkshire's heritage, actually you can't separate Yorkshire's heritage from the national picture and from the global picture as well, because this is something that, you know, although we're talking about it here and how important it is to us, actually it's important to us as a nation as well that we're able to hold on to all this. So whilst we could come up with all kinds of strategies regionally with very little in the way of investment, what we, well, I seem to be hearing coming through is there actually needs to be some understanding that this is a national strategic issue that needs leadership at a national level. So that's it sorted then. <laughs> so what, where do we take this? How do we take this forward? What ideally would you like to see? Sue, so you've unmuted first. Oh, no, it, I asked one of my colleagues in the curatorial team um, what our relationship is with um, production companies, independent production companies. Um, and he answered me by saying the health of the national collection depends on good relationships with indies over the long term to make sure their output is properly represented. And I said, then how does that actually work? Um, and he said, you know, it, it's a kind of hearts and minds work and it's about relationships and conversations. But he also said, you know, it is something that we are looking at, you know, post COVID and, and lockdown to look at how do we approach that more strategically. Um, and again, I think it's something through the forum that we have with our partners in the National and Regional Archives. That's a conversation that we could all have in a joined up way. I don't know whether, as you're saying, Sally, it's about, uh, you know, webinars like this or meetings, or I don't think there's a simple answer, but actually it's a conversation. And I think when it comes to national, uh, you know, who leads on this, obviously you want, um, a sort of consistent national approach to it. But there is also a role in this with um, a local role in this. It's, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to resources and you have to look to national pots of money on the whole for the big resources to, you know, protect and preserve the sector. But what then do you do if you have a really, really strong local story that comes up and that you desperately need to get hold of that material and that then requires additional resource. If your na na national strategies are not always that good at flexing to meet local opportunity and local demand, therefore it's really important locally that you get the buy-in, understanding and support from the local political bodies so that when something really local and exciting comes up, there is a mechanism that allows, in the, you know, in, in the case of Yorkshire, YFA to step in and, and get hold of that material and protect it for the future. So national policy is great, but with the opportunity to flex, to meet local demand and the buy-in from local partners, you can't delegate it all to national bodies who frequently exist hundreds of miles away from you. If this matters to Yorkshire, then Yorkshire has to have a role and a say in what it preserves, what it protects, and a role in helping fund that. Anybody else want to contribute to that one? Nope. Well, yeah, I don't want to get, I hope I'm not giving the impression that it should be kind of, you know, determined from national ergo London, um, but I think a joined up conversation and obviously um, in partnership I think you're absolutely right, Sally, about regional and local. Yeah. 
but it's one of those things that needs so it needs leadership it needs leadership nationally it needs leadership locally and as sally says that there's there's, there's the flex in there as well to recognizing the 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 diversity that is across there and also regions know their regions their regions best we've got another question which uh, it's an interesting one this one uh, because he answers is alex wilson saying uh, uh, and this is not a bot uh, so it's just say, can the panel please discuss future prospects of adopting artificial intelligence processes as a way of alleviating limited resources in screen heritage, i.e. automation in cataloging, editing and delivery? Alex says tools are out there um, and uh, already. And but Alex also says, I advocate humans. This is not a bot. So is can art can. Can artificial intelligence processes help at all, Sue, with the process? Sue Howard? Uh, undoubtedly, but I always come down on the human side. So I think it's 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 just what Sally was saying about, you know, it's not only regional, it's about local. And with a lot of this, curation is key. So you know, how do you do that? You have to have the knowledge to do it. So yeah, I, I am sure you know, there's really smart, really clever experiments going on at the moment that we will eventually be able to benefit from. But at the moment, I'm in agreement that the human side is, is what is needed. But the other thing about that is, well, it's what I was saying earlier about it needing to be visible. You know, we talk about the content and we talk about what is you know, those, what, what is really important. Actually, we can have as much content, but unless we have some rich metadata to go with it and keep it findable, we won't see that content either. So as well as the moving image, we need to have the information. Thank you. Um, it's a really, really good question, and it's it's not in my um, realm of expertise by any stretch of the imagination. But it's something that we, we you know, we are looking at. Um, you know, lots of very smart people and departments are looking at um, across the UK, um, and it you know, it's definitely something that we need to explore and investigate. It doesn't replace curation. It doesn't replace the human intervention. But are there things, you know, even on a basic level like speech to text that enhance or enable curation? But it's definitely something that um, we need to look at. Yeah. And David, do you do you use any automated processes over at, uh, at the BBC? Yeah, it's similar to everybody else. I mean, we uh, there are massive benefits in it, but it doesn't seem like the technology is quite there yet. So speech to text, definitely we're already using. But when you're getting to kind of video capture, um, it, it often needs a human to kind of unravel uh, what it's created. So it doesn't seem beneficial yet. And it doesn't seem to alleviate that resource uh, because you still need a human to actually go in and say whether it's right or wrong, um, which seems to minimise the point. Mm. So uh, still working on it. Yeah. So, so thank you to all the people who sent questions through. We've also had a question, David, to ask if you were the person that went to find the bullseye. Yeah, no, no, not me. It wasn't me. <laughs> so thank you for that question. I wish I had, though, yeah. <laughs> no, it, was a, it was great. It was a great programme. If you haven't watched the Pembroke Murders, go, Pembrokeshire Murders, go and watch it. It's brilliant. And it shows the importance of having a good archive. It really yeah. does. Uh, we're coming up towards the end now. I've only got a few more minutes left. So I'd just like to ask, I mean, we've, we've covered most of the questions that we, we had anticipated we were going to uh, um, cover. Um, what, let me just fi finalise by asking each of you, what would you like to see happen, re Yorkshire's legacy and the future TV output? What would you like to see happen? So I don't know who wants to go first. Sorry, Fiona, could you just repeat the question? What would you like to see happen with Yorkshire's archive, Yorkshire's legacy uh, and future, future TV output? I suppose the initial dream would be to make it all digitally available. So first of all, get, make it all digital and then actually make it accessible. Right. And get it all 
all into one place or all into lots of satellite places, but people know where it is? Uh, I think it's increasing the access to it. So from a production point of view, definitely, but also so the audience can get access to it as well. I mean, Sue and I have been working on a project to try and get more of the uh, Leeds content digitised uh, from 68 onwards uh, because um, most of it's not been touched, most of it's not been seen. So you say people might not be interested in it, but no one's actually seen it. It's never left the can. So actually getting it out there and letting, pe letting people breathe and see it is, is, an, is an important part of archive. Thank you. Uh, Sue, Sue Todd. Yeah, um, as well as the obvious of making sure it's safe, it's collected, it's preserved and made accessible, um, from my perspective, to ensure that Yorkshire is very much part of the joined up conversation um, nationally, so that you know Yorkshire voice, Yorkshire production, Yorkshire content is represented and accessible, um, and that Yorkshire contribution to projects like Britain on Film has been massively important. Um, so that's that would be my hope for the future. Thank you, Sue Howard. You are our hope for the future. Am I? Oh, right. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm going to echo what David and Sue have said. It, it is about that visibility. Of course, I'd like to see all of it protected and preserved. But what I'd also like to see is if our job isn't simply to say, well, we've collected it all and, and there it is. It's about how is that used? So that, that comes back down to the value of it. So for me, it's never about job done. It's about, okay, but how might you use that differently? So for example, one of the things that we're just starting to do in another project is to look at legacy news reporting, but open up, open up that debate with younger audiences because they get their news in a completely different way. So what's the debate about fake news, you know, trusted two sources of news for a previous generation, etc. So actually, I'd really like to see collections used and valued and you bring new perspectives to it. I can see here a considerable enhanced role coming through for the film researcher on programmes. You know, seen as a specialist skill, which I'm sure it is, but it is a really specialist skill to be able to track down and find and negotiate all, all of this. So, I that. Mark, what's your thought? Uh, you know, advancements in technology are remarkable. And in, in the time that I've been in, in the industry, it's gone from telecine to cards this big, which is sticking cameras. Um, it's amazing. I mean, in our news library now, we have a system where we can go back about four or five years and it'll come up as a digital file instead of being on tape. Um, the ultimate aim would be to get everything uh, digitized so that you can click on stuff like that. And I, I know I'm talking about it from a news point of view and there's so many other, many other uh, forms, but, um, but what we have in news is, is, uh, is unique. And as I said, absolutely unique there. It's just unique um, because it's ours and it just it, it, it's a picture of what life was and you can pick a year and it's really so important to be able to go back to that and look at it um, and use it and if we can somehow get that available at our fingertips like we can for footage which is just five or six years old that would be a fantastic legacy going forward thank you very much and Sally, I started with you, so it feels only right that I come to you right at the end as well and ask for your thoughts. Um, well, I think that regional collections are often the most important in the country because they capture the character of a region, whether it's Yorkshire or the Midlands or the Southwest. There is something about the material that is held in those collections which is vital to the cultural, historic um, history of our country. But that material is only of value if it is used and seen by people. Therefore, the need to make that material available, to get it digitized, to get it curated, 
is absolutely paramount. So I think for me, what do we need? We need continued resource, we need consistent resource into the sector, um, but we also have to really value what we hold as, as a region. Um, and I feel so strongly about that. Some of the best programming in this nation's history has come out of the English regions. Um, there may be more that has been made from London, but what we hold in these regional film archives is, is a treasure like no, no nothing else. So preserving that, but getting it out to an audience who can use it, um, it requires resource, but it's worth the money. It is, you know, if, if we let this material go, it will never be replaced again. It's the same as paper documents. So it, it just requires um, a political will to invest in the sector and for that funding to come through on a on a consistent basis so that would be what i would really like to see brilliant thank you very much thank you to all the panel because that's been an absolutely extraordinary hour and if you're not convinced listening to this about the importance of archive and prepared to go out and be ambassadorial about it then we will make you watch this again because we're recording it we'll put it out there for you to watch it again because it's really a compelling argument i think we've heard tonight so our time is up. We have to wind it up. Um, we know we've we've uh, we've raised more questions than we've given answers to through this. It's inevitable with 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 something like this. But hopefully, giving you food for thought and things to think about when we watch those programs and think, well, that's our legacy. Where's it going to go? So many thanks to you, the panel, for taking your time to come share your experience, your skills, your knowledge, and your passion with us. I'd like to thank Dale Grayson at RTS Archive Group for producing tonight. And thank you to all of you out there who've been watching us. It's been really great. Take care. And I hope we can all meet together soon and take this conversation even further. So we'll say goodbye for now. Bye now. <laughs>